Good evening, my friends, and thank you for coming all the way out here this evening. I know many of you are considerably busy already, maintaining your company's contributions to the war effort. Before we get started, can I interest anyone in another glass of port? No? Uh, whiskey, perhaps? Oh well, jolly good. Let's get started then. Now, as you know, you have been summoned here to form the Third Party Engineering and Acquisition of British Armour Group. You and your esteemed colleagues here gathered are therefore those whom the War Office has selected as the heads of industry in possession not only of the factories capable of producing armoured fighting vehicles, but also of the necessary designers and engineers on staff to develop new designs from the ground up. This group now has a prestigious and storied history, and designs produced by your hands have proven instrumental time and again in the defence of the realm for which His Majesty's government remains sincerely grateful. However, while peace may have been hard won on the home front, the war is far from over. Mainland Europe remained occupied under the iron fist of the Nazis and their wretched puppets. Norway and Denmark too. As we celebrated the successful defence of our homeland, we also mourned the defeat of our forces in Greece, and the loss of that noble land to Hitler's insatiable ambition. While we successfully put down the uprising in Iraq, no thanks to Axis interference there, and carried out a successful campaign in Syria and Lebanon, the battles in northern Africa continued to rage, of course, and as you'll be aware from the news, Operation Battle Axe proved to be largely a failure and costly in tanks to boot. Hopefully with Auchinleck now at the helm, and as A-13s and Matildas are gradually replaced by charred desert cruisers and Castellan infantry tanks, we will start to see a reversal of our fortunes there. Still, not all our attention rests on the western desert. Military planners have been considering for some time already how we will begin to prize occupied lands back from the cruel vice grip of the Third Reich. The idea of launching a naval invasion against a prepared enemy on the defence is daunting, to say the least, and sure to be costly in both lives and material. But what other prospect for final victory against the Hun is there? Every day our diplomats petition the Americans to join the fray in the name of democracy. But for now we must settle for the resources they provide via Lend-Lease. So we are building our forces and planning meticulously for naval invasions of our own against German-occupied territory, both in Europe and Scandinavia. As I am sure you'll understand, such plans are highly classified, and I am not at liberty to expand upon them, even to this group. Mark me, though. Wherever and whenever we make our counter-attack against the Jerrys, you can bet your scotch one thing. Tanks will be a vital part of the vanguard and essential to smashing through the Bosch's coastal defences, wherever and whenever the conditions allow them to be landed. Now, as far as the upcoming battles in mainland Europe are concerned, we feel we are well equipped, or soon to be anyway, with the Castellan Infantry Tank, the Cataphract Infantry Combat Support Vehicle, and of course, the brand new KT Mark 12 Cruiser, which has already begun production, though it will take some time for us to reach a full complement of this highly advanced machine not least on account of the fact that only so many of our factories are capable of producing the large castings it requires. Until such production capacity has been scaled up, we will be supplementing its production and substituting it in certain formations with a limited production run of the equally capable and effective Valkyrie A99 Lioness, which can be more easily produced in factories with more limited facilities. However, certain (coughs) internal concerns at Valkyrie Motorworks that prevent us from relying on the Lioness as our main cruiser design at this time, however. Besides, Valkyrie Motorworks is already thoroughly busy building as many Castellans as it possibly can, and on top of finishing the necessary Aegis ICSVs needed to outfit the elite Trident Division. Anyway, suffice it to say, you and your colleagues here have done Britain proud, and we now boast arguably the most powerful and advanced fleet of armoured fighting vehicles in the world. Bravo to all of you. But, lessons learned in the Battle of Greece have certain members of the top brass concerned that our regular tanks, while well suited to the predicted battles in France and Germany, may struggle in the more mountainous warfare we can expect in future campaigns to regain the likes of Greece, Norway and, dare I say it, Italy. 
German panzers, while yet again instrumental to the Axis victory in Greece, were observed to find the mountainous terrain and narrow passes and hairpins to be very hard going. And while this proved to work in our favour on the defence and bought us vital time in the retreat from Thermopylae to Thebes, we can expect the very same conditions to work against us when we hopefully retread and reclaim that same ground. So then, the war office has drawn up a new specification for a so-called mountain tank, a tank that is to be the master of the very terrain usually deemed to be the bane of the tank. And it is now your job, ladies and gentlemen, to devise and submit prototypes to meet and exceed that lofty goal. This one will not be easy, I can assure you. Never more so has the war office come so close to baying for the moon, I fear. Such a demanding specification is sure to stretch every ounce and inch of ingenuity you possess. You will need to bring all of your experience in tank design so far to bear on this one, I fear. But I know that you are the very people for the job. You are the ones who have made British tanks the envy of the world. If you cannot do this, then no one can. The tank we require will be light enough and compact enough to transport by sea as well as rail, and to be landed on beaches should the need arise, while also being able to cross weak bridges and traverse narrow roads and mountain passes. It should be nimble, and while its speed will not be the main focus, it should not be sluggish either. As it will fight primarily in hilly areas, it should excel at hill climbing and have excellent gun depression, while bringing to bear firepower that can engage both enemy tanks as well as light fortifications and entrenched positions. Reliability and range are paramount for the long remote marches such a vehicle must complete too, of course. If you are not too intimidated already, then I bid you please look over the proposed specification here. All of the parameters are entirely your choice, if they are not listed in the specification. Vehicles that do not meet the fixed criteria in any of the categories will be disqualified, scoring zero for that category. So please, do read the specification very carefully before you set to work. Your deadline, ladies and gentlemen, is a fortnight from today, the 22nd of August. Please note that this date is simply the deadline for design proposals, and gives no indication whatsoever of any form of timescale for when such a vehicle may be needed for an incursion into enemy territory. Even so, you would do well to remember that you are each of you bound by the Official Secrets Act, and keep your work on this task a need-to-know matter within your respective companies. Before we conclude tonight's meeting, I would just like to invite each of you to raise your glasses with me. Here's to you all and to the tanks you will design, and to the victories they will surely bring us in good time. A toast, ladies and gentlemen, to the third-party engineering and acquisition of British Armour Group. May God bless her and all who sail in her. Now, I've kept you long enough, and your chauffeurs will doubtless be getting restless. To your drawing boards then, my friends, and the very best of luck to each of you.